Gone Fishing. Part 2. The Fisherman. He had long hair, he had a mullet. You know, he had a vest. He always wore boots, either, you know, motorcycle boots or high work boots, jeans. You know, he was just a typical Westie, I suppose you'd describe him. We were both really keen fishermen. Every chance he would get, so normally the week at work would revolve around planning what tides were good wear on the weekend, and then that would be where he sort of headed off. But his favourite place to fish was unfortunately where everyone presumed that he went missing off the rocks, which was uh, Whorapu. The night Dean Sands disappeared, he wasn't meant to be alone. Jean Davey, Dean's friend, was meant to have gone fishing with him after work. So the fact Dean was fishing alone when a rogue wave ripped him off the rocks at Fatipu was just horrible dumb luck. At least, that's what Jean thought back then. And as the search for Dean began, it never crossed Jean's mind that it could be murder. From Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Dean Fuller Sands goes missing in 1989. Eight years later, police arrest four people for his murder. According to the police version of events, a woman called Gail Maney, then just 22, wanted Dean dead because she thought he'd stolen some drugs and some leathers from her house. The police have decided that a man called Stephen Stone, who was only 19 at the time, carried out the killing. Then two other men helped him take Dean's body to Gail's house in Larnock Road, Henderson in the boot of a car. For more than 20 years, Gail has been saying she's innocent. She spent many years in jail for killing Dean Fuller Sands, but according to her, she never knew him. In fact, she thinks he wasn't even murdered. Adam and I drive to Fatipu on a fine Wednesday morning, there's a big warning sign before you even reach the car park. Strong rips or currents, large waves, deep holes, unstable cliffs, concealed water waves. Fatipu is a desolate stretch of Auckland's west coast, right at the mouth of the Manukau Harbour. Way out from the beach, ocean swells smash into a sandbar. The waves are still big by the time they reach the shore. We go to Fatipu partly because it was Dean Fulisan's favourite fishing spot. He liked the Nine Pin and the other main fishing rock here, Paratutai. So this is a chance to learn a little more about the young man who police say was murdered in August 1989. To understand him a little, because this isn't just Gail's story, this is Dean's. The beach is near deserted, but as we walk back to the car park, we meet a fisherman, Paul Middleton. He says Fatipu has a reputation. It's pretty damn dangerous. <laughs> I mean, I've spoken to the rangers and they've rescued quite a few people off there, you know, people drown and stuff. When you're out there on the nine pins, you just get these big waves that crash over and you never turn your back on the sea there, never. The waves are coming up four or five feet over where you're standing and then you just get that big one that just, you'd be buried and you're washed off and as soon as you're washed off that rock out there, you're out in the ocean and you swept away miles. Real bad news. <laughs> Real bad news. So the other reason we go to Fatipu is because we have to consider this question. Is this the place where it all ended for Dean? Because that's what Gail Maney thinks. I believe that he possibly drowned when he went fishing and it, could, it was an accident because only saying that based on the evidence produced by my private investigator, John Bradley, which showed that there was actually a, um, a king tide, I think, that night and a storm did actually come across. And back then you could only get on to the um, place where he went fishing two hours before high tide and you couldn't get off till two hours after high tide. And it's a dangerous west coast beach. 
Gail's theory isn't at all far-fetched. For eight years, that's precisely what Dean's family and the police believed. To build a picture of Dean and of his last night, we read police job sheets and court transcripts, and we also spoke to Jean Davey. He and Dean worked at a tyre shop in Newmarket in the 80s. They were friends for three or four years. Now, Jean Davey owns his own tyre shop in Henderson. And as a side note, he's also a champion woodchopper. He's won loads of Axeman medals at rural shows. He had a quirky sense of humour. He could be very serious. We got along quite well and found the music going, but he definitely clashed with some of the other guys. He was a good hard worker and he would work hard and then he would play hard in the evenings and that usually meant either out on his motorbike or um, tinkering with his bike or uh, fishing was his probably his single passion in life. Rock fishing, you know. Gene can't quite remember why he didn't go fishing with Dean that night. He thinks perhaps he was ill that day. Yeah, for whatever reason I didn't go. There was a spring tide that night, which makes the rocks that much more dangerous. But Gene says that wouldn't have put his friend off. He probably saw that as an opportunity for a, a better chance at catching good fish. He was definitely water savvy. He understood the dangers and risks of fishing off rocks. In any case, Dean set off from home on his own that evening. Monday, 21st of August, 1989, around 5 p.m. Dean Fuller-Sand's mother, Carol, is mowing the lawn out the back of their Blockhouse Bay home. As she rounds the corner, she sees Dean. He's just back from work. She didn't hear him arrive, but he's leaving already. He's backing out the driveway in his burnt orange Hillman Avenger. He's told his father, Stuart, he's going fishing. Stuart has a Holden ute, and he tells Dean, if you catch too many fish, give your old man a call, and I'll come and pick them up. Carol sees that Dean's rods and his fishing backpack are in the car. She's cooking roast chicken for dinner, Dean's favourite. She tells him she'll keep him a plate and later puts it in the microwave. In the morning, when she sees the meal is untouched, she's not too worried. Maybe Dean stayed overnight at a friend's house and has gone straight to work. But then she learns that he wasn't at work either. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was his mum or his dad ringing me at work to just say that he you know, he still wasn't home sort of thing. And had I heard or something like that, and I, I mean, I had not I guess then I started thinking, OK, well, that's a little bit weird, you know. On the Tuesday evening, Dean's mother Carol calls her son-in-law, Paul Curran. She asks him to drive with her to Cornwallis Beach. That's where she thinks Dean said he was going fishing. She wants Paul to keep an eye on either side of the road while she drives. Sometimes Dean drives too fast. Perhaps he's been in an accident. But Paul says Dean doesn't fish at Cornwallis. He's much more likely to have gone to Fotipu, which is in the same direction, but half an hour further. Paul phones the owner of the lodge at Fotipu. She looks out the window and tells him a burnt orange Hillman Avenger is sitting in the beach parking lot. That's Dean's car. Paul picks the phone up again. This time, he calls the police. Dean's family don't search for him on Tuesday night. The weather's too bad. But early Wednesday, Dean's brother Wayne and his sister Leone head to Fatipu with their mother. Stuart stays home. He's recently had a stroke. When they arrive, Dean's car is still in the car park. Unlocked. There is some loose change lying around, and a towel has been placed over the stereo. Dean usually does that when he parks up, because there's a light on the stereo that doesn't turn off. And I remember when I first saw the car, I, I, I suspect that something really weird had happened because I saw where the car was parked and the times I'd been with him, that was never where we parked the car. Jean spends the week searching the coastline with Dean's family and the police. In that time, they find three items at the high tide mark. A red Dolphin brand torch, a blue soap dish, and a can of CRC lubricant spray. The torch is the same type as one Dean got for his 21st birthday four months earlier. The soap dish? No one specifically recognises it, but his mum says it's the kind of thing he kept his hooks in. The CRC? Dean owned a can. The family figures these are probably Dean's things. A police helicopter hovers overhead that week, but there's no sign of Dean's fishing rods or his backpack. And there's no sign of Dean. I 
I guess at that stage we were all still hoping for a positive outcome. You know, maybe he'd fallen and injured himself. In the end, it was, you know, the searchers were coming up with nothing and we'd, we'd searched what we considered well and truly beyond the normal realms of where his body may have shown up if it was going to show up. From that week on, as far as everyone is concerned, Dean Fuller Sands is drowned while fishing. Well, except Dean's sister Leone, she feels something's wrong. Unlike Jean Davy, she thinks it's strange that Dean would fish the Fatipu rocks on a spring tide. It seems too dangerous. And those three items that were found, torch, soap dish, CRC, sure, at the time the family presumed they were Dean's, but they'd been clutching at straws during that search. And they're such common items, they really could have been anybody's. The strangeness of Dean's disappearance eats away at Leone. After six years, in late 1995, she writes to police. The last I heard from the police after he went missing was six months later, and since then I've heard absolutely nothing. This had left a lot of questions unanswered. First and foremost is, at what stage do you list my brother as officially deceased? Are the police still investigating his disappearance, or have you closed his case? I would also like to know how many other persons have gone missing in that area, and whether their bodies have been found. I was very close to my brother. His disappearance is still unsolved and still weighs on me heavily. An officer writes back. He says only a coroner can call for an inquest, and in the absence of any unusual circumstances, that hasn't happened. As for ruling Dean officially deceased, a missing person is presumed dead only after seven years. And no, says the officer, police are not actively pursuing the case. The file isn't closed, but it's inactivated. And that's how things stay for a couple more years. He went missing, fishing off the rocks of Waterpoo, and for all intents and purposes, he drowned. It wasn't until seven years later that someone gave us some information and said, well, no, he didn't drown. That's former Detective Inspector Mark Franklin. You'll recall he's the West Auckland cop who drove the Dean Fuller Sands murder investigation. It was at this stage, when police hadn't thought about Dean's disappearance for years, that they got that phone tip about someone seeing a body in a boot at a house in Henderson. Remember, that first tip was from a man called Dave Arnott. He told police that back in the day, his partner Tanya Wilson had seen a body in a boot at the house of Gail Maney in Larnock Road, Henderson. That's the Tanya Wilson, who was Gail Maney's childhood friend, who also became her flatmate. Police didn't know who the supposed victim might be, so they looked through historic missing person cases and also began questioning people associated with Larnock Road in 1989. They decided the body was most likely that of Dean Fuller Sands. I vividly remember being called out to the Henderson Police Station. That's Tony Wall. He's a colleague of ours at Stuff. But in 1998, he was a police reporter for the New Zealand Herald. It was announced that they had a, an, a very, very interesting um, murder case on their hands. Whenever a, a cold case gets reopened like that, it's catnip to police reporters, I guess. You know, we, we, we love that kind of thing because of the mysterious nature of it. it. It was a juicy one, I guess you'd say, you know, without being disrespectful. The, the fact that, you know, it was initially treated as a just a, an innocent sort of drowning type scenario and suddenly it's now a murder. You're like, wow, you know, what's going on here? Eventually, police interviewed hundreds of people. They became increasingly confident of the connections between Dean Fuller Sands and Larnock Road and made their four arrests. Stephen Stone for killing Dean. Mark Henriksen and Colin Maney for helping move the body. And for commissioning Dean's death, Gail Maney. I had to go to the police station and I was kept in the cells all night and then going to court the next day and the media were there. You know, they were at the fence trying to get my photo and things like that and yeah, it was pretty scary. The news that Dean's disappearance has become a murder investigation is a shock to family as well. Early on, well before we started recording interviews for this podcast, Amy had a brief conversation with Dean's mother, Carol. On the phone, Carol didn't want to talk for long, but she did tell me she just wanted Gail Maney and Stephen Stone to admit what they'd done and to tell her where her son was. Then she'd finally be able to give him a decent burial. She said her other son, Wayne, missed his brother Dean like hell. They'd been very close, even though they were chalk and cheese. She said until she knew where her son was, Gail Maney and Stephen Stone could stay in prison and rot as far as she was concerned. She was also very angry about the way she found out that Dean's death had become a homicide case. She was at work at a countdown supermarket when she got a phone call from the police. They told her they'd arrested someone for her son's murder. 
She was stunned. She had no idea an investigation was even underway. And to find out at work like that? Well, that was the worst. Since then, with the trials and everything, it had been a nightmare. She didn't know who to believe or what was going on. A few months ago, we went to Carol's house in a Waikato town. We wanted to let her know we're doing this podcast, and we wanted to hear more about Dean. He's right at the heart of the story, but we know very little about him. Who he was as a son, as a brother. How is he remembered? How has his disappearance affected the family? Knocking on doors is one of the things journalists do. And you'd be surprised how often people are willing to talk about terrible things that have happened to them. But we also get criticised for, I don't know, being ghoulish. And sometimes, maybe that's fair. Carol hasn't returned a phone message, so we know she may not be keen to talk to us. But we need to give this one more go. In the end, we're interested in Dean Fuller-Sands because Gail Maney has spent a third of her life in jail for his murder. And she says she's innocent. And by the time we reach Carol's door, we've done enough research to have some reasonable concerns about Gail's conviction. So there we are on Carol's doorstep. I've got a bulky recorder on my shoulder and the microphones are sticking out of the pocket. The recorder's running, standard practice to get the sounds of footsteps and saying hello. The door is open when we get there, but Carol is vacuuming the floor and doesn't hear us. Hello? But her husband does. (laughs) Carol turns off the vacuum cleaner and comes to the door. Before we say a word, the expression on her face hardens. Hi, you Carol? My name's Adam Dunning. Then, as we start explaining why we're here, Carol literally starts to shake. She says, why do you keep dredging this up? And I start to answer, but she's really upset and, and keeps going. She talks for another 30 seconds or so, but we've decided not to use that tape. It's clear that Carol is extremely distressed, partly because of what's happened to Dean, but also because of us. She says her son is gone, no one can tell her where he is, and she doesn't want it in the papers. She says, I can't take any more of this, and then she asks her husband to get rid of us. Adam and I leave. We've both done door knocks like this before, but it's not often it goes like this, and we're both feeling a little bit shaken. But then we go back and talk for just a little longer, with Carol's husband this time. We actually have a duty of care to warn them that a story is coming and to let them know it's going to be broadcast and published. We've left in such a rush that we left that bit out. We tell them all this, apologise for upsetting Carol so much, give him a card and leave again. The idea that Dean drowned is an important part of Gail's defence, but it's far from all of it. In part one, we talked about the depositions hearing, where the case against Gail Maney and her three co-defendants was outlined. Well, I'm going to walk you through a few key reasons why the case presented there doesn't quite stack up. First, motive. Gail is meant to have ordered Dean's killing because she thought he'd stolen some things from her house. We've touched on this already, but it's important, so I'm going to say it again. Gail says she never even met Dean. When I was charged with murder on the 3rd of June, on the 3rd of July, 1997, that was the first time. That was the first time I'd heard the name Dean Fuller Sandys. Notice how Gail always says Dean Fuller Sandys. We'd noticed that all the archival Radio New Zealand bulletins always said it Fuller Sands. So we asked Gail if she knew which was the right pronunciation. Well, I always thought they said called it Dean Fuller Sandys. I don't know. Um, I guess it's... It could have got lost in, along the way, but I'm sure that in the court they referred to as um, Fuller Sandys. We double-checked, and for the record, though some people get it wrong when they talk to us, the name really is Fuller Sands. This guy, who Gail says she never even met, it seems kind of interesting that she doesn't even know how to say his name. I've never met Dean, but I guess that in some ways he's kind of become part of my life because I've been accused of his alleged murder. Um, so throughout my journey in prison and things like that, I used to think about, I learned that his birthday was on the 8th of April. So, I mean, I guess I feel for his family too because I'm a mother and as a mother, you know, you want some answers, you know, that this is someone's child um, and and he's a person um, and, and they want some answers and this is, like, horrible. 
But in the weeks leading up to her arrest and after, the police remain adamant that Gail does know Dean. There were parties at Larnock Road in 1989, often wild parties. And Dean, while they say he used to go to them, there are photos to prove it. Or, at least, that's what Detective Inspector Mark Franklin tells us. To be fair to him, his memory on this might be a bit murky, but he does say it again and again. His photograph was amongst the occupants of the house. We tell him we'd love to see those photographs. He was linked into that address because we had photographs of him being there on different occasions. He is really emphatic on this point. It was Dean present at 22 Larnock Road in the lounge attending parties. He was part of the Larnock Road scene. And again. Here's the photos of him at the parties in her presence. We tracked down some of the photos police collected as part of the evidence. There are many of the crowded Larnock Road, so it gives us an idea of who hung out there. We've also seen some photos of Dean. In one, he's smiling, holding a huge fish. There's one of his friends standing by his burnt orange Hillman Avenger, but we've never seen any of Dean at Larnock Road. So where are those photos? While making this podcast, we asked the New Zealand police to provide us with quite a bit of information. They found reasons to refuse or sidestep virtually every single request we made. At one point, they quoted us about $12,000 to prepare files for us to view. We didn't take up the offer. But the idea that there might be a photo of Dean with Gale at Larnock Road seems incredible. If it exists, it would be simple proof that Gail is lying when she says she never met him. So our Official Information Act request to the police on this point is pretty specific. Adam emails the cop who's been assigned to deal with our requests, Detective Roger Small. Adam's asking for a range of stuff, but writes... I'm especially keen to see any images that show, one, Dean Fuller Sands at 22 Larnock Road or at an address believed to be 22 Larnock Road, two, any images that show Gail Maney with Dean or in a setting where Dean and she appear to be at the same place at the same time. In his reply, Detective Small gives a three-word answer on each point. One, we have none. And two, we have none. Roger Small goes on to write... We do have some photographs that were taken at Larnock Road. They're from a personal photo album and not able to be released. They show various persons at the address, but not Dean. So it seems that Frankton was wrong on this detail. But let's not get overexcited. The non-existence of a photo of Gail with Dean doesn't prove they never met. I've met you, Amy, and I'm not sure if I've ever seen a photo of us together. Yes, but that photo would have totally undermined Gail's version of events. So it seems pretty important that it doesn't exist. And Mark Franklin says four times they do exist. Anyway, if Gail says she didn't know Dean, then how did the police land on the burglary motive? Who told the police he stole her drugs and she got mad? I can't recall who it was, but I think it probably was Tanya. The notes will show this, but... There was clear evidence that there was a burglar at that address and that leather jackets and some drugs were stolen. That's right. It was Tanya Wilson, Gail's old school friend, Gail's one-time flatmate, who told them this. She's there with Gail when she discovers the burglary. The leathers that are stolen, those are Tanya's. And when Gail marches next door to ask the neighbour whether she's seen anything... Tanya is there with her, along with another flatmate who we are calling Sonia. But there's a second reason to question the police version of events. Because what if events happened in a different order to what was said in court? What if one of the key witnesses wasn't even there? The seemingly minor burglary is meant to be the event that triggered Gail to order a hit on Dean. So obviously, it needs to have happened before Dean disappeared on the 21st of August, 1989. If it didn't, well, what does that do to the police case? Because here's the thing, Gail is sure the burglary didn't happen until 1990, months after Dean disappeared, and she can prove it. It's pretty compelling stuff, but does it amount to proof? You can decide for yourself soon, but first, here's what we do know about the burglary. This comes from police job sheets and court transcripts. The burglary was seen by Gail's neighbour. Her name is Catherine Sal, though Gail used to call her the old bat. In return, Sal wasn't overly fond of Gail and the others at number 22. 
this woman was an independent woman, quite intelligent. Her hearing wasn't good, but the people that interviewed her found her to be a good witness. She made a clear statement. She gave that evidence. She knew the neighbours. She knew Tania. She knew Gail. The afternoon after the burglary, when they noticed their stuff is missing, Gail, Tanya and their other friend Sonia march next door to Catherine Sale's house. They ask her if she's seen anything suspicious. Sale says she saw someone at their house the day before when no one was home. But she thought he was a friend of theirs. She thinks she's seen him around before. And anyway, he knew his way around the property. He'd gone down the drive, straight round the back and scaled a deck before going into the house through the ranch slider off Gail's bedroom. She didn't think much of it. And when she saw him walk back up the drive and hop into a light-coloured car where another man with sandy hair was waiting, she didn't think much of that either. Until now. Until Gail and her two friends rock up on her porch and bang on her door. What did he look like, they ask her. Well, she says, he was wearing black jeans and a leather jacket. He was tall and skinny and his complexion was olive. His dark hair was long and swished back. To be fair, this is actually the description of a good percentage of men living in West Auckland in the 1980s. Anyway, the mood changes. The women tell Sal that the man has ripped them off. Gail becomes hostile. She turns away and starts talking to Tanya and Sonia. And then they all leave. After that, Sal says things return to normal next door. It's busy, as usual. The parties are still wild. She's still being abused by Gail and her friends. To sum up, it's torture. She doesn't know if Gail and her flatmates ever called police about the burglary. Here's the thing. Police say the burglary happened a week or two before Dean Fulisans disappeared on August 21st, 1989. Plenty of time for Gail to get angry and order a hit. But Gail is certain the burglary didn't happen till May 1990. In fact, she places it within a week of the 14th of May, because that's a date she remembers very clearly. I'm going to rewind to a few weeks before that 14th of May date. Stick with us here because the dates are very important. One weekend in April 1990, Gail and Tanya go to the Anglo-American Easter bike run in Waihi. She remembers Sonia moving into Larnock Road with her and Tanya the weekend after that. So there's that. Gail says if the burglary happened in August 1989, Sonia couldn't have been with her and Tanya on Catherine Sowell's doorstep because she wasn't living at Larnock Road yet. But there's more to it. Weeks after Sonia moves in, on the 14th of May, 1990, Gail asks her to babysit her daughter, Colleen. Colleen is two years old. Gail and Tanya are going to a party. They're off their heads on poles. They swallowed a couple of Rohypnol before going out, and then at about 7 p.m., Gail receives a panic call from Sonia. I'm not sure how she gets this call since barely anyone had a mobile phone in 1989, so I'm guessing it was to a landline. Sonia left some pills on the table and Colleen has swallowed them. It happened about an hour before that phone call. Now, the toddler is bumping into the walls and doing strange things. Gail panics. Tanya calls an ambulance and they rush home. Colleen is taken to Princess Mary Children's Hospital. This was before Auckland Starship was built. She stops breathing as soon as she gets there. The little girl pulls through. But this is why Gail remembers that date so clearly. She's got the hospital documents to prove it. And she is absolutely certain the burglary with the weed and the leathers happened only a few days after that unforgettable incident. And there's one more thing. Another, even more compelling reason to believe that the burglary which Catherine Sowell saw cannot possibly have taken place in August 1989. The reason? Sal's house wasn't even built then. When you look at the electrician and the drain line, who say the neighbour who was the key, a key witness, she was wrong. She was totally wrong. That's John Bradley. He's a former police officer turned private investigator who takes on Gail's case. That conversation is from a phone call I had with him in early 2018. He's been unwell. He's had a heart attack a few weeks before, and the day before we're meant to meet with him, he texts me. Hi. After your call yesterday, I was a bit stressed and had an angina attack. I am only a few weeks past hospital admission for a heart attack and still limited by doctors on what I can do. I do not need any stress and so we'll cancel our appointment tomorrow morning regarding Gail. 
So we don't meet John Bradley, and we don't want to add to his stress by hounding him further. But we do have a treasure trove of documents and affidavits and other research that Bradley did into Gail's case over a number of years. And what he says on the phone about the electrician and the drain layer, those are pieces of evidence that he gathered that prove Catherine Sowell's house was not fit to live in in August 1989. Larnock Road in 1989 had a reputation. But when Gail, her partner David McGalley and their daughter Carleen moved into number 22 in late 1988, they were a quiet family. The section next door was empty, apart from the large phoenix palm out the front. Catherine Sull bought the section in early 1989 and started clearing it out. Building on the house didn't start until June. Gail says that Sull only moved into the finished house in October 1989. Sal, though, says that's not true. She says she moved into the house shortly after her birthday, in July that year. That puts her in the house two months before Dean Fuller Sands disappears, and right in time to see the burglary that supposedly kicks everything off. For us, this is a problem for the police case, because Gail can prove Sal wrong. John Bradley helped her do that. While he investigates her case, he tracks down a plumber and an electrician. Both men give John Bradley documents to prove when they did their work, job sheets, invoices and council permits. The electrician says he started wiring up the house on the 5th of October 1989. The only power to the house was a temporary low wattage connection for builder's tools. He says there was no one living there at the time. And how could they be? There was no hot water, the stove wouldn't have worked, and in the dead of winter, in August, wouldn't you need some way to heat your house? Anyway, it takes him 14 days to finish the work. The plumber starts work the next day, on the 19th of October. Like the electrician, he has no axe to grind in this case. And like the electrician, he's working there many weeks after Dean has disappeared. The kitchen, bathroom and laundry gully traps are not in place. He says that if anyone was living in the house at the time, all the dirty grey water from the sinks, washing machines, showers and baths would be on the lawn. Also, the toilets are not hooked up to a sewer. It might be plausible for someone to camp out in their home without hot water, without a stove to cook on and without proper heating in winter. But... Is it reasonable that a person would choose to live in a house where there is no sewage outlet? And the plumber is certain that the house didn't have a temporary toilet connection. So, if anyone was using the toilet before October the 19th, sewage would have flowed into and piled up in the garden. Imagine that. If the burglary happens after the state, the motor for Gale's hit evaporates. So this stuff matters. This really helps Gail's case. Could Sal have got it wrong? And what does she make of what the electrician and plumber are saying? We wanted to hear her version. Had she really been camping there back then? Hello? The house in Lanark Road where Gail once lived has recently been renovated for resale and the property has been subdivided. Catherine Sal's place next door has changed too. The house built in 1989 has been joined by a collection of sheds and caravans and parked cars. In the yard there's a 44 gallon drum that's clearly been used as an incinerator. There's a mattress leaning against a shed and a large collection of garden furniture. It's basically a bit of a hoarder's paradise. The main entrance is on a deck down the side of the house. From there you get a pretty good view of the side and back of Gail's old house next door including the one-car garage underneath. So this must be where Gail, Tanya and Sonia stood as Sal told them about the burglary. Amy and I visit several times when Sal isn't home. Oh, hi, sorry to bother you. Oh, um, are we looking for Catherine? Oh, she's not home at the moment. Oh, yeah, we... Um, you... But finally... Oh, my name's Adam and this is Amy. And I think um, Tui might have told you we came around the other day looking for you. Yeah. Yeah. Done that before. And bullshit that we've done that before. So that audio isn't very clear. 
But Catherine Sahl says, media, I'm not interested. I've done that before and the bullshit that was in the Herald. She says the case is all done and dusted. She makes it clear that she's no fan of Gail Maney, but she doesn't want to say anything on the record. We talk for a while off the record, but we learn nothing new about just when Sahl moved in and when her plumbing and wiring were actually in place. Then Catherine's son calls to her from inside. He needs a ride somewhere. She says she'll drop him off. Our conversation is over. When Gail first started telling me about her story, these are the three things that stood out. The fact that Gail says she never met Dean, the timing of the burglary, and when Sal's house was built. I thought, if Gail could prove all of this, how did the case even get to trial? It might be hard to prove that Gail never met Dean, but there are documents to prove that the wiring and the plumbing on Sal's house weren't in place until October 1989, two months after Dean Fulisans disappeared, so how could she have seen a burglary in August? Gail told me a few other things that cast doubt on the police timeline. We'll get to that later. But the more I got to know her, the more she told me about her life. She didn't sugarcoat any of it. Gail was wild. She ran with a rough crowd. She did drugs. Her rap sheet is long. I've definitely had times where I have been like violent and um, in my past. <laughs> I started to wonder if perhaps this was part of the reason Gail Maney was found guilty of murder. After all, if you were on a jury, what would you think if you learned that the woman in the dock had a history of violence through the 1990s, that her friends were criminals, that one time she threatened the man next door with a knife, that once she smashed her own partner over the head with a Jim Beam bottle. Next time on Gone Fishing. Those kind of parties were like really good nights because you like totally smashed and half of West Auckland's there and everyone's tripping out on LSD. And we were all reasonable people back then. We just all rode around on motorbikes all weekend and had fun and everything else. And Maybe if I didn't get charged with murder, maybe in a couple more months, I probably would have OD- naturally OD'd. My world was just a blur. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poet. Visuals by Jason Dore. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. Subscribe.